the phone. Right. All right, folks, we're going to get started here. My name is Kristen Tanner, and I'm the program manager for Alliance Community Health Services here at Innovate Marquette Smart Zone. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's our third installment of Tech Talks, and we're super excited for tonight's speaker. We're going to have Ben Vandenbrook talk about 3D printing. So really exciting stuff. Just have a few housekeeping items to go through before we get the show on the All right. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but just in case this is your first event here, I just want to tell you a little bit more about Innovate Marquette and what we're all about. Um, so we are in the business incubator and accelerator. It's kind of just a fancy way of saying we help businesses get started and we help them grow. So just know we are a resource to local entrepreneurs, innovators, and business owners right here in our Marquette community. Um, if you haven't been to our new office yet, we're located in downtown Marquette on 101 West Washington Street in the Flagstar Bank building. Come check us out. Um, we also have um, some folks here in the audience, some team members here. So if you have a brilliant idea that you want to run past us, help us kind of guide you through this. Come find us after the event. Sarah's going to be working the check-in table. She'll have her laptop up, and we can literally go through the process of submitting your idea. Um, we also, you can also find us online. So we have our website, our phone number, and uh, email address listed. So a lot of ways to find us, but just want to remind you folks that we are a resource. We're here to help. The entrepreneurial journey is very exciting, but it can be intimidating at times. You really need a lot of people um, kind of on your side to guide you through it, and we're here to do that. So um, for tonight's event, um, glad to see you all here. Would really love your feedback. That really helps us improve our events and just making them bigger and stronger as we go on. So Hopefully all you've got a program when you walked in, there's a QR code in there to scan. So please take a few minutes. I promise it's only a few questions, but your feedback is really valuable. So let us know what you thought about tonight's event. Um, we also have another Tech Talk coming up. It is a series. So the next one after tonight is on February 9th. We'll be at the Ordock Brewing Company. Uh, Dave Olawa, he's our resident and entrepreneur at Innovate Marquette Smart Zone. And he's gonna be talking about outdoor rec innovation. So. Each installment is a different speaker and a different topic. So make sure you come to all of them. There's a lot of exciting stuff. Um, tonight obviously wouldn't be happening if we didn't have this wonderful venue in our backyard to host an event like this. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Anne and Andrea and the entire staff here at Peter White Library for just allowing us to gather in a space like this. And it also wouldn't be possible without our amazing sponsors. So a big shout out to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, or the MEBC for short, and the City of Marquette. Our programs and services are supported in part through those partners. So with that, I want to get to the task on hand. We have a fantastic speaker, as I mentioned. Ben is a wonderful member of our community, relatively new to our community. Um, but has made such an immediate impact since he's joined us here. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Ben over the last year or so, and every conversation I have with him, I'm just constantly blown away by his passion, enthusiasm, and expert knowledge on his craft. He is just a wonderful human being, has a fascinating journey, um, so I'm really excited for you all to learn about his adventures as a creative tech professional and local business owner. So. Please join me in welcoming Ben Sandenbrook. All right, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, so, my name is Ben, and I am the owner of Art Lab 3D Printing. This this business uh, had a long journey to get here, and it was, and especially to get up to Marquette. But Art Lab is at least at its core, is a creative solutions company. It is essentially, you've got a problem, we can probably figure out a way to fix it or make it or do it with uh, 3D printing technology or some other digital creative solution. So um, I'm just gonna kind of give a little bit of a background about myself before I get into it. I am, uh, I've been in th into 3D printing for over a decade since the early foundations of it. And this, presentation is going to kind of go through that history. It's going to go through the basically the last decade of my life and also just show you what you can do with a 3D printer today. Um, 
When I got started, I was a visual effects artist for Cartoon Network. I was uh, working on a show called Robot Chicken. And at that time, uh, we needed props and small little things for the show. And I'll get into showing some behind the scenes stuff as well with that, so you can see that. Uh, otherwise, I am mostly focused at trying to start new ventures, new projects, and I got a lot of stuff in the pipeline right now that I'm, I can't really talk about everything, but I'm excited about what's coming. But uh, otherwise, and I'll get into this as well, going into it, during COVID, I built a, look, well, built that, renovated a plus, and then converted that into a 3D printing studio. So um, over here though, this, this little printer right here is this guy right here, and that photo is from the is from the major fair in San Francisco. And I was the only guy walking around with a portable 3D printer at that time. This guy ran on a LiPo battery that I hot wired and it was very flammable. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I, 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 I put a bunch of business cards out and I got some really great connections, which led my, my business to at least, at least to get customers from all across the country. So that, that was one trip that was very well worth it. But some of the other stuff we do, we also do 3D scanning and small batch manufacturing. So if you wanted to make, say, the first 100 runs of a new product that you're, that you're developing, we can do that for you. So uh, I'll just get into it. So when I got started, it was, I just got out of film school in 2008. And I was, I was very familiar with Adult Swim as a fan of like cartoon shows and everything else. I, I'm a child, permanently, at heart. And the thing is, is that I recognized one of the productions that came up, which was this show, Titan Maximum. That they hired me on as an intern with no pay uh, to uh, fix a problem. And that you'll notice this is a recurring theme with this presentation: failure, mistakes, and problems. They're actually the greatest inspiration for how uh, finding new direction and what you're going to do. And well, in uh, this 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 uh, post online was asking for four interns to come in and work on the show. And I came in and I realized why they asked for four interns. The, pu the, pu the puppet department ordered glass eyes on all these characters. They shot three episodes and realized they could see the animator all the eyes because they reflected back the light from the, from the studio. And basically the, all three episodes were useless because all the faces, everything, that was devastating. So they, so they hired us on to manually fix every pupil in the show. And well, uh, I got sick of doing that after the first week. I, I just, that was, that was basically torture. So I wrote a script in After Effects to go in and basically circle the eye and automatically remove the issue, which was a high luminance. And they hired me <laughs> right after that because I fixed what was, would have been weeks and weeks and weeks of work in about three days. So uh, because of that, they brought me on and these guys here, they, Every, everything started because of these folks here. And that little weirdo in the background right there, that's me. Um, what happened was I, I was 19 years old at that time. And uh, I was surrounded by people who had so much more talent than me. I was, I was so shy and so nervous that I didn't even tell them I, had, I, had, I had, didn't have the money to go to lunch with them. You know what I mean? So I just stayed and kept working. And so eventually they found out. And so they started bringing me along to places, doing things. and. Eventually, I got into film production uh, because I was always in the background. I was always someone that worked post department, all that. I did some direction, but it, it just wasn't really something that I, I really connected with. But I made my first short film with these guys down here. Uh, it was a short called The Highs and Lows of Milo Brown. And it was written by this guy, uh, my buddy Malcolm, who is in all sorts of stuff. He's in the last episode of The Office. He's in, um, uh, oh man, I don't even want to keep going. He's, he, he has a wonderful career. And uh, I, I can't thank Malcolm Moore for accelerating my, my, my position in Hollywood at the time. And so we had the premiere for Titan Maximum, which had like Billy Dee Williams from Star Wars and various other people in there. And oh man, I, I, I was a wreck <laughs> at that red carpet. But uh, I, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. The thing is, is that we ended up winning an Emmy for the project that we did, which was uh, after Titan Maximum, when they brought me on and hired me, I started working at Robot Chicken. Um, there was a problem where they had shot this entire scene and well, the half the set was missing. And so I went in and fixed it. So this is that scene, assuming I can hit play on this thing. Yeah. Oh, hold on a second, we get the audio up. There we go. 
Might be a little bit of lag on the audio. Okay, sorry, it's a little blown out here. So let me actually rewind this a little bit. Sorry, right, guys. If you don't mind, I'm just going to shut the lights down a bit. I think that'll work. Oh, that just turned them all on. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> let's try. Let's try this one. Any luck? Let's see. I'll just turn them off. I think that'll work. Take it smoothly. All right, there we go. Now I should be able to. Yeah. Wait up. Sorry, the audio's cutting out a bit here. I did the background on all of this here. I did that guy there. And then half this second, I think. All this right here. That was all done. That's John Stewart. So <laughs> that 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 short right there won our team an Emmy. Uh, weirdly enough, uh, we got invited to Industrial Light and Magic up at Skywalker Ranch, and we showed them this, and they were like, "Okay, uh, you guys can release it. That's fine." <laughs> so we got we got Lucas's approval. We we put it up on there, and oh man, it was such a fantastic experience to to, to have that, especially since my older brother is the biggest Star Wars nerd I know, and I brought him along uh, for that. So. He just, he had a great time. But uh, what that meant though, was that at least for me, I, I, I felt like my career was pretty set at that point. I'm just gonna be a guy that works visual effects on stop motion, right? So I started working for a company called Starburns Industries. And these guys here is a much smaller team than Robot Chicken. Um, it's, it's roughly 15 people at the time. Um, so we were making shows like Frank, uh, like Frank and Hole and Moral Oral and a couple others. And then here's the thing. Um, well, I started this, it's, it's really what happened was it kind of like a, a shock came down from the, from the upper, uh, what do you call it? From, from the up, upper, upper top people that they had said, Hey, we got, we got a show greenlit and it's all 2d. Sorry, sorry, stop motion guys. We're going to move on to another medium entirely, which is Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty got bought and this entire studio disappeared. So. And that included me. So what I ended up happening was this woman right here, which I'm not going to show her face just because she's uh, very, very, her reputation is amazing. And I just don't want to in any way, I didn't ask permission to show her face, so I'm not going to do it. But uh, she worked for Pixar and on, uh, on Finding Nemo. And I was so fortunate to be sitting right here, right next to her, because she was the one who ordered the first 3D print for me. She ordered about six or seven small little buildings. They looked like, they looked bad. They were just very rough. And at the time, the industry was super, super early. So I just had this little thing that I had read about online just sitting in my house that I was messing with. And she ordered those seven little buildings. Well, it turns out um, that was for Google. It was for an internal employee ad, like something that say like, hey, if you have a complaint with HR, here's how you file it. And it was like one of those like infographic videos. And so my little buildings were in the background and all that, and they paid me 400 bucks. So I felt like I got ripped off there. So uh, instead I started a business to make sure that never happened again, to make sure that I would have a sustainable pipeline of production for 3D printing. But here's the thing, that industry didn't exist yet. It literally was a bunch of nerds in a room trying to figure out how to get these things to work. And I was one of those nerds. So um, the thing is, is that I bounced around at a couple different studios trying to figure out exactly who I should work with and, and really how to do it because I was completely ignorant. I, I, I knew as much about electrical engineering at that point as a, a basically like, like a Lego kit. I barely knew how that stuff worked. So instead, I went and met up with these two guys here at the Sony lot, which is right here. The thing is, is that 
what they don't what, what you don't know is that these these studios are kind of like little little societies, little little communities of people, and inside of them, they have a makerspace, and that's where I met Diego and Rich. Uh, Diego is, I think, the very first 3D printing Kickstarter period for an open source kit. That's Diego. I really have everything to thank for him when it comes to the 3D printing industry because he had a vision for a storefront, for an idea that you would be able to walk in and do, use a 3D printer or learn how to make it or whatever. And he, he brought me on. I, like I said, I had lost my, my job at Stop Motion because Rick and Morty got picked up. So I, I needed something to do and I, was, I had a little bit of money laying, laying around so I could go, okay, I could take a little bit of time off. Well, I didn't end up coming back. I just ended up keep doing 3D printing stuff. So my buddy Wes down here, um, he took the kit printer that we had, this little thing that, uh, that had barely ran, that thing, that thing was a, a nightmare to get working. We had traded that into Diego to one of his uh, printers that he was starting to sell on Kickstarters. And that's, that's the thing that's so interesting about this is that you guys have to remember that this printer, which is very familiar to you guys today, if you are familiar with all the 3D printing, that looks like a Creality, right? That looks like something from that you would buy for about three or 400 bucks on Amazon. They stole that from Diego. They literally went to Maker Fairs and took pictures of his prototype printer and then copied that over and brought it to China. So every one of those Creality, what is called a box style printer, this, this, uh, this kind of box frame here, is based off of his work and Rich's work. Then MakerBot came and stole Rich's extruder as well. So all this open source stuff suddenly became privatized and made it, it, companies were running away with it. So instead, Diego started shifting into different directions outside of 3D printing, and I kept focusing on it. I kept focusing not on the printers because for him, Diego felt like everything was taken from him. While for me, I was simply seeing more opportunity because more printers were coming, more materials were coming, so on and so forth. And so what happened was uh, Diego had a storefront where you could come in and utilize his 3D printers, but he expected you to buy one of his printers. That was his main business model. And the problem with that is, is most people don't have the time. They don't have the experience. And frankly, the Wikipedia, the wiki that he wrote was 80 pages. So it's a lot. It's a lot to consume as, as, as just a, a user. And so my business model instead was to accept people coming in and I could just print something for you. And I was only gonna charge you 10 bucks to do it, at least to start. And well, uh, Diego and I had a pretty pretty uh, strong uh, uh, disconnect about that. So um, I decided that instead of trying to get his company to do this, that I would start my own. But I didn't do it in Los Angeles because frankly, the, the market there is so saturated with at the time, there was like half million dollar 3D printers. They're not even 3D printers. They're, they're called additive manufacturing machines. And those additive manufacturing machines kind of uh, dulled the excitement for the industry because they, they had access to them. They, they were attached to Paramount and very big studios. So when they saw my little kit printer that literally they made like almost like just, just like very rough shapes, they were not impressed. But man, was I. I was excited because that little thing I built myself. You know, like that's that that that's excitement. So I, I decided to just bring that technology back to Kentucky. And when I did, I didn't have any like startup money or anything like that. I just had enough that I could move back to Kentucky and, and get a place. And well, uh, I started working with a local with a local makerspace called Create Now. And at the time, they were only more focused on woodworking and metal. That was the only thing they wanted to do. And I, I told them, look, if you let me come in and just have a space and be your first incubator, then I, I will do everything I can to make sure this is successful. And I did. I, 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 went in, I, I did everything from like renovate the walls and clean out the building and do everything. I, I, I had learned so much about traditional like skill and craft that I just simply didn't know in LA that uh, I'm so thankful for this experience. With all that said, it was really problematic and frustrating because one of the things that came up with this whole makerspace model was the idea that people can come in and utilize your technology, your machines, your whatever. And well, that means a lot of stuff broke very often. And oftentimes I was pulled in all sorts of different directions that my brain just kind of became frazzled. So 
with uh, with Jess here. Well, this is an example here I'll show. With Jess, he's currently he was currently working on a couple small like racer drones. And the thing is, is that the the entire time that that's happening in the background, there is a public event happening here that is completely distracting him from it. He looks great in that photo, but man, he's not getting any work done. So there is just a lot of conflict and a lot of frustration about having to work in a very public space on what usually is a rather intimate experience of trying to figure something out, trying to make it work. So after a couple of years, just kind of, you know, it was about, I think about three years of doing this, I decided to branch off of the major space and start up my own business. And that was, hold on, is that up in that screen? Yeah, it should be. So this business here from 2016 to last year was uh, the only 3D printing shop in Kentucky, period, which meant that I was very busy. I printed a lot of stuff. And keep in mind, UPS was one of my competitors. UPS had a location for a little while that was making 3D prints and then shipping them out as an experimental business model in Louisville. And I'll tell you right now, it, that failed very fast. And the reason why was because they bit off a lot more than they could chew. And I know what my limits are because these printers have so much that they can only spit out so much plastic. So you can just do the math and figure out exactly what your limitations are. They didn't do that. So they got, they ended up just breaking off a bunch of clients that they had very much trusted for a while. And I ended up consuming them. So, uh, you know, uh, seeing like, like, uh, orders from aerospace companies and all that stuff show up like in your email one day is very shocking. So uh, this right here, and, and the, the, the big ass fans that's, that's listed here, that's actually a satellite. That's currently floating in space somewhere. Um, what it is, is an airflow test. And that airflow test had these little donkeys in it that we printed. So currently, uh, even though it's been sanitized, I think technically there's some germs of mine in space right now. That's cool. <laughs> um, but uh, then the thing is, is that, that 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 ended up branching into all sorts of different, um, you know, avenues of 3D printing from you know corporate solutions like that, where we're trying to make something that's a really unique and specific, to just taking in someone's broken part and repairing it, but not repairing the original, printing out a copy of it. So right here is the original, um, I forgot exactly what this part's for, but I believe it's for a like a, a large like canopy or tent. And this is like that mounting arm that's there. This is a copy of it that is printed after it's been 3D scanned. And I'll get into 3D scanning here in a bit. But what's really interesting about this is that um, when I gave it to the customer, he wasn't, he, he, it functioned, everything fine. He was upset that it wasn't glossy. So, uh, you know, you never can ever make everyone happy, but at the end of the day, I was, this is one of, this is one of my favorite prints, but I will say that um, when it comes to like this business and everything moving forward from here, 3D scanning is by far, I think the most accessible way to get into 3D printing if you can get access to the technology. And we do have that here. So, and at the Innovate Marquette, we have two different kinds of scanners. Um, they actually, they have it, not me. They have two scanners. It is a tabletop scanner and a handheld scanner. The handheld scanner lets you do big things like cars and engine bays and all that kind of stuff, uh, even entire rooms. Uh, or the, the tabletop scanner is really designed for small things. And that's actually what I use the most, the tabletop scanner, because it lets me be able to just quickly scan a small part. So um, let me just kind of get into a little bit of the background of the actual business model of our lab. We are an education first business. I actually, my, this is my trick, and it's probably not the smartest trick. I try not to make money the first time I meet somebody. That's, that's usually the way I go, is I try to teach them something and get them excited about something and let them know that there's something new that they didn't know, and then I try to sell it. Because then they are engaged, they're interested, and they're excited about what you're talking about, and maybe the sticker price won't shock them as much. So when you're talking about a 3D printer, or uh, specifically a professional 3D printer that's meant for business and and higher end production, you know, we're talking about in the thousands of price. That's actually really cheap compared to corporate printers that cost 25,000 to a half million. So um, yeah, the industry just completely shifted while I was in business. It shifted from um, just tinkers, small consumers, like just making things to entire corporations wanting to buy hundreds of these 3D printers. 
And I got a little chunk of that money, so I was very fortunate for that. But the thing is, is that in education for business, I would have never been able to get into those doors if I didn't have the focus to say, hey, let me show you why I'm so excited about this, and then we'll figure out if it works, makes sense for you. I don't care if I'm wasting my time. I know I'm, I'm, I know I won't waste yours. So that's the kind of enthusiasm I, I had walking in the door. Now, the, I'm just going to kind of go through 3D printing a bit in terms of, this is probably familiar to a bunch of folks here, but there is three major forms of 3D printing. We have the FDM FFF, which is fused deposit molding, or this is actually the non-copyrighted version of this. Um, the idea with this is that it's literally just a, a hot glue gun with a motor on it that's pushing material off. It's basically just a, a, form, of, um, a form of extrusion. And SLA DLP is where there is a vat of resin instead of plastic, and that resin is then solidified uh, and then pulled out. And then lastly, we have SLS or DMLS, and DMLS is for metal, while SLS is for just about everything else, mostly nylon. And the thing is, is this process here is designed for, um, for materials that simply do not conform to their shape for very long, like uh, anything that's uh, very, very flexible, very soft. The powder locks the design inside of the shape and basically forces it to not distort. And so uh, I, I tend to tell people that this is the easiest way to get into 3D printing. This gives you higher results, but it's a higher price. And this one, you need to pull out a mortgage, a second mortgage to get. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, it's essentially from left to right in terms of expense. Um, and, and, and from here, uh, but, they, but I will say this though, they all work the same way. They work by adding layers from the start, from, from just a flat plate. They add layer by layer by layer by layer by layer until you're done. The average design is anywhere between about 500 layers to 10,000 layers. It just really depends on how how refined and detailed you're doing. You, you want your design to be. In fact, at the end, tends to benefit most when you're not trying to be that refined. As soon as you can make nice thick layers, nice thick lines, if that's acceptable for you, FDM tends to work best. But all right, so um, I want to show you kind of some of the products that we end up making with this because I, it's one thing to talk about 3D printing, and it's another thing to see what people do with it. So. Every one of these people, um, they're, they're not tech savvy. They just gave me a phone call and they said they wanted to do something. They wanted to make something. So each one of these, uh, and, and, and excuse me, I don't remember all their names. So I'm just gonna kind of go through. Uh, this was an architecture project. She was, uh, it was due in two days. <coughs> and she just was super desperate to get it done. And uh, I, I, I went through and fixed her model and did all that stuff. And that's the thing. When you're connected with universities and you try to make things that work for the students, sometimes it's a point where the student is the one that was at fault for not being fast enough or whatever the situation is, or not or not putting in the due diligence to get it done on time. For her, it was a completely unique situation. It was actually the fact that her hard drive crashed on the drive over to my to my studio to print her thing. So we had to work on old files and get it all running and all this stuff. So she was very lucky to get this at all because her computer was not almost non-existent by the time we were done with that. So the thing is, is that this is just an architecture model. And I say just because it's, it's actually relatively simple. It's just a bunch of white shapes uh, that we then can glue together. But then when we start to apply application where there's, there's, there's actual use of this, like for example, here with these iron gate replacements, that has to last outside. It has to survive extreme temperatures sometimes. And overall, it just can't be brittle. It can't be weak. It can't. It, it, it's a product. You have to. It has to survive it, uh, some kind of lifespan. And well, the thing is, is that these iron gates here were printed with polycarbonate. Polycarbonate's the same thing you make like hurricane shutters with. You know, so that stuff was super durable. He ended up just painting it white and then slapping it on there. Can you tell me which one the, is the fake one? They all are. They got ripped them all out <laughs> and replaced them with mine just because they wanted them all to match. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Uh, from here, there's various different like fan models and things like that. But this one is one of the funniest ones. This guy breeds serval cats. Big, big cats. So I'm talking like cats that are like this big. And well, they they make they, they, he has a huge litter box that he has to go through because he has four of them. <laughs> And that is a giant litter scoop. <laughs> so he needed a way to very efficiently handle this problem. And guess what? He now sells these. 
They need big scoops. So there you go. Uh, awesome, awesome to see that for development. And I do have a couple examples here of things that people have made with me in development. Um, this was for the, uh, originally for UK, uh, University of Kentucky. But this is ended up being bought by the Miami Dolphins as a flag waiver. This is not my invention, keep in mind. But this here, which I'm not sure if it's going to work because it's been a while since I turned on. This actually glows and shines and makes music. So, like, it's starting to glow right now, but the more you spin it, the louder it gets. And that's the thing. Like, right now, it's probably been too long since I turned it on. But the, uh, or the battery's been dead because this thing is, like, six years old now. But, yes, so the idea was this little flag waver was actually the most successful invention to come out of my shop. I didn't invent this, but he prototyped about a dozen of these little stick things, and I had no idea what they were for. But there you go. That's what it was. But he ended up selling them to Miami Dolphins, and you could just go get them now. If you go, if you go, if you go to a Dolphins game in, in Florida, it, you'll get one of those. Um, so the thing is, is that uh, this also kind of goes into some of the more business-oriented projects as well. So this one's a little tough to see without me kind of pushing this sucker out here. But this is actually for a company that sends genetically modified mosquitoes to your house, so that they kill all the mosquitoes that are inside of your of your, your yard or whatever the situation is. And they needed a way to not kill the mosquitoes when they injected them into this tube. So this here is a 3D print of just a grid. It's literally one of the simplest prints I've ever made. But this grid here prevented the death of about, uh, they averaged about 400 mosquitoes for every time they filled up like their, their run. So even though they're just mosquitoes, I, I know that this is super fascinating to me because it's just, it's just a little net. That's all it is. But this ended up being, they, they ended up going and basically patenting this shape, this design, all that stuff, and now it's the main way that you transport mosquitoes. So that's super cool. All right, that's gone. All right. So, lastly, let's see what we got here. Okay, so this here is, um, uh, I've, I've done like prosthetic arms. I've done other like random, like, you know, uh, acts of like kindness and charity and stuff. But this guy here, uh, I believe his name is William, he uh, came by and he said, I, I, I'm trying to print a cone. And I'm like, okay, what, what, what for, you know, that's fine. We can print a cone. And then he hung up on me. And he shows up at my door like two days later. And he's like, I want to print these. I'm like, this is more than a cone. I know what this is. And so we printed one out at much larger size than the original. So I'll go here. Photograph. That's another good thing. Even if it falls out, it shouldn't break. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Now. So. All right, and then he immediately told me to make twelve more. So, uh, so the thing about this is that not only was the acoustics good that came out of the print that we had, they were actually better because the way it was less tinny. It didn't have the resonance of metal and copper. And he's, he's referring to it dropping because that's exactly what happened. It was a large cone, not as large as this one, but it was a large cone, and it slipped off and the entire thing shattered. So he didn't have his, his max volume co uh, photograph cone anymore. So we printed that on out, and then, he, like I said, we printed a bunch of them out because he just wanted different volume, different tones. You have to literally calibrate those things by changing the cone on it. So super cool to see, uh, and actually, Dick, Dick played it for me. You know what I mean? Well, that's, that, that, that's neat. So then uh, there's also something called a lithopane. And a lithopane is essentially a three-dimensional print that only lets in so much light in order to create an image on the other side. Um, and you can do a reverse lithopane as well. If you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland and been on the Haunted Mansion ride and saw the faces looking at you, you know, you can do the same thing with this. But uh, this here, is for a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, 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 yeah, a, 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 I believe a jockey in, in Kentucky, he's the owner of a jockey. And what's neat about this is that it looks like that when it's turned off. But when it's turned on, you see the image in perfect clarity. And that is entirely 3D printed. The, the box, the frame, everything, the only thing that's not are these little bolts that I used to slap together. Um, 
the, the bulb itself is just an Amazon kit, I think, for like 15 bucks. So, very cool. Uh, and I, that's what, one of my favorite. I ended up making a cylindrical one for my mom that's like seven different photos of my dad. My dad passed away a few years ago, but it's just a bunch of photos of him and everything like that. She, she just cherishes that thing. So I, I, I love making little things. They are a little tricky to hone in though. Like you really need to like make each one unique for the customer. Because some people like, you know, landscapes and suddenly it's all, you know, a bunch of leaves and things and that just becomes very chaos imagery. So I try to tell people when you're making a lip of paint, try not to have any trees in it because it just looks like chaos. Anyway, so this is the biggest restoration project I did. Uh, over here, this statue uh, had the arms broken off 20 at, the, well now it would be 25 years ago, but at the time it was 25 years ago, somebody tried to climb over that gate that's right over here off of this statue and broke both the arms. And uh, it's been broken ever since. Uh, everybody who came comes by to that church, everyone that was participating in that, just knew it as the armless Christ. That's exactly what everyone knew. Well, uh, they asked me, can you fix it? Can, is there any way that a 3D printer can repair this? And this is a full repair. This is uh, what I did, was I took the fingers, the hands, all the broken bits that were there that was left of the original two arms, and my, my partner sculpted new fingers. Everything that's black here is a sculpt. And then we ran that through the 3D scanner, which again, I'll get into that in a bit. We ran it through the 3D scanner to, cap to capture a 3D model of each hand, and then printed it. And what we ended up with was a duplicate that was much lighter than the original because it's made out of plastic instead of concrete. So what that meant was that not only was it, was it you know, a, a return to its original shape, but now it was much lighter, which means if I go back here, they won't break again because the, the weight of these hands are so light that you can essentially like, you know, like when I when I put them on there, the scan was so good, I almost didn't need glue because it like locked into place with all the cracks and breaks and stuff. So when you get really good with the scanner, you can really do some pretty incredible stuff. Um, but, uh, I, I guess the main thing here when it comes to the, the application behind 3D printing, a lot of people get stuck on one thing, which is they don't have computer aid design uh, experience or knowledge in terms of making a 3D model, the thing that you send to the 3D printer to make the design. And so I wanted to make that as simple and easy as possible, especially with the popularity of a website called Thingiverse from MakerBot. It was basically saying, find one of these files, send it to my website, and I'll print it for you, if anything works for you. Turns out, that was a massive business boost to be able to basically say, if you're looking for something and you don't know how to make it, you can probably find someone that did, that already did it. And that's, so if there's any website I'm going to recommend you go to, there's a couple of different 3D printing websites today. But Thingiverse is the biggest, but it's also the most saturated. It's, there's a lot of garbage <laughs> on that website. So you might want to look at a couple other websites, just explore around. Um, particularly GrabCAD, which is like the GitHub guys. So if you're into programming and stuff like that, GrabCAD is probably your go-to. Um, but I personally love Sketchfab, which is a 3D modeling and viewer. It lets you like spin 3D models around in a very dynamic way. It's a very cool way to show off your stuff. So. Uh, but essentially it works like this. You get one of those files or you make it, you click on that big green button there, you upload it and it gives you a price. It's that simple. And the reason why that works is because the CPM, the industry all kind of caught up with what I was doing. Uh, not by any intention. I'm, I was completely, you know, a uh, uh, mystery to all these people. That's fine. But the, the key thing was is in New York, a guy um, who, uh, Constantine actually, Constantine is, is my life. He, he saved my entire business model because he created a CPM or, or, or a way to, uh, to, to uh, manage your customers within a 3D printing environment. And so I integrated that in my website and that's what happens when you click this button. It just instantly brings you to that CPM. And it's been history ever since. And essentially everyone has been sending me 3D prints of every sort of design you can imagine. And I, I tend to like I tend to print them, but I always give a warning, especially when someone brings something that is beyond the capability of the printer. I just tell them there's 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 no guarantees here. I cannot guarantee you that it's going to look good or that it's going to be great or function well simply because of these worries. And um, 
it turns out that people really appreciated knowing that they're not going to waste their money. So uh, I got recommendations, new good reviews. I often got reviews from people that never printed with me, which is very interesting. Mm. Um, just people saying, oh, he was great. He did a fun, he did so much fun stuff for me and helped me out. And uh, I didn't end up buying anything from him, but here you go. And they just felt bad and they just gave me a good review. So that, that that's interesting to see. Uh, again, education first business model is something that I really, really believe in. And it's something that I, I, I think that is not done enough because it's, it's, it's a bit altruistic. It's also just kind of giving stuff away, honestly. But I, 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 I love it. Um, so let's talk about the methods of creating a 3D model to send to a printer. Um, the, the most traditional and normal way to do it is with CAD or computer-aided design. There's hundreds, well, dozens, let's just say dozens of 3D printing programs that are out there that are focused on this process. And essentially what you're going to be doing is creating a 3D model that is solid, that from, from the outside, it's, 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 it's completely surrounded with, with what is called facets or, or, um, or triangles or whatever, whatever you want to call them. There's all sorts of different. The problem with this and the reason why CAD is not exactly the easiest thing to jump into is every program has different terms, different, different uh, ways and uh, workflows to approach 3D modeling. So uh, I tend to recommend if, you, if there's anyone that wants to get into CAD particularly, Tinkercad. It is a program that honestly is the easiest to get into for 3D modeling and lets you make functional stuff, not just like cutesy characters and things like that. You can make real products with Tinkercad to an extent. It has its limits, but it lets you at least like if you need to make a door jam, you can make a door jam. You can make anything you want when it comes to that. It's really more about what what you want to do beyond that. So for example, if you wanted to organic, like do organic modeling, like sculpt a person or a creature, then you probably want to use a program called Blender or Maya. Particularly, there's like sculpting programs in there that really let you hone in and act like you're working with clay instead of working with math. So um, from there, 3D scanning, this is that little scanner I got here. This is essentially the easiest way to get into it because it just means you pop something down and it gets a 3D model of it and then you print it. But there is like tweaking and, and, and modification that tends to have to be done in order to get it to look or behave the way that the original did. So sometimes when we're scanning stuff, we don't exactly get one-to-one -one with the original, but oftentimes we make a better product than the original. And I can explain that with one really good example. Um, have you ever broken anything in your fridge by accident? Like any of those little handles or, or any sort of like small drawer or anything like that? There's always this like small plastic part that's like, like why isn't it solid? Like why is it hollow and with a bunch of like little ribs in it and it just broke on me, right? Always this little brittle thing. That's because there's a form of obsolescence that's inside of a lot of the products that we use today that the only reason why it's there is because it means it's cheaper to make. Uh, it means that I can make uh, a thousand of these instead of a hundred of these with the same material because I made it I made it just weak enough to, to work, but not forever. Essentially, no one wants to make the light bulb that lasts forever because then you destroy the light bulb industry. So that's that's the logic there anyway. So the thing is, is oftentimes the parts that would be coming to me, I end up printing thicker, stronger, or better than the original part. And the well, that 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 has that has a lot of benefits. But also, it's it's one of those things that people don't really realize just exactly how things are made around them. So what I, I felt like one of the things I learned the most as I was going through this process was just manufacturing in general and how popular, or not popular, but how uh, diverse that that is. Everything from injection molding all the way to, um, uh, to the forging and, and working with metals and all that. Those are all those processes are unique to themselves to the point where someone comes in and brings something that is that I, they expect you to replicate, and I'm going to tell them, look, it's going to be different. It's always going to be a little bit different, a little, a little, it may not work because it's different. We'll have to see. <laughs> so uh, the materials here, they range very dramatically, especially with FBM materials. You tend to have a much wider range of materials when you talk about the cheaper method versus the more expensive, but they range anything from rigid to flexible to uh, sometimes they have an odor. It's like there's some of them that just like smell pretty. Uh, and I don't know why you would spend twice as much money to have a, something you can just spray perfume on later. But anyway, 
Um, there's all sorts. There's all sorts of different materials for different reasons. The most common material we end up printing with is PLA, which is a corn-based plastic. It is, a, it is not technically biodegradable. It is technically biodegradable, but you have to put it through a chemical compost to do that, which means you can't just put it in the landfill. So a lot of people have that misunderstanding about the that plastic. It, it, and and the most I feel like the most my favorite material to print with is actually polycarbonate. The last one here. It's just the strongest, most durable material. And then lastly, uh, or well, I guess one of the last things here is to just kind of talk about the range of services that ArtLife does provide. We are we do provide support for open source. We have 3D scanning, FPM, SLA solutions as well. And eventually we'll get into SLS, but we usually order out the SLS stuff. And then the proprietary solutions, the reason why that's not in the services here is because it takes up too much, too much time. Uh, lastly, I have a bus, which I don't have a ton of pictures of here, sadly, I'm sorry. It's really in the works still, even though I've, I lived in there for a year and a half. Um, it's still very much a work in progress. But the idea behind it was that it is a fully mobile 3D printing studio. It has 500 amp hours of lithium batteries, so that essentially means that even if I'm down in negative 20 degree temperature, I can still 3D print. Uh, and then the solar collection on top is about the same as a single outlet. So 1,200 watts is how much you'd be getting in. However much power you can get from one of those outlets, about 15 amps, that's, what, that's what's there. So uh, lastly, uh, the scanning and the reason why I'm doing this. So scanning meant that I could just go anywhere and scan stuff. I had a, I, I had a real dumb idea that I decided to pursue while I was in the bus called realfakerocks.com. And the idea was to 3D scan rocks and sell them as NFTs. And, um, well, I sold like two. Uh, it was funny. It was funny. But they had like all sorts of like arbitrary stats. And the idea was that they were all based on, on music genres. So like this rock was particularly metal or this rock was particularly punk. You know what I mean? Like it was all very random. It was all run through randomization thing. And, uh, well, I guess the joke landed for a couple people. So they did. But, uh, yeah. So me, me, me. Um, that's it. So uh, I, if anyone's got any questions or anything like that, I'm happy to go through. But Kristen, is there anything else? Like, I don't know how much time we got left. We got time but for questions. So let's give a round of applause. <laughs> if, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll put on the lights a little bit more yeah. here so that it's a little easier to see people. Yeah. Like I said, um, we have time for questions. I hope you all have come up with some great ones. Obviously, you've done for a lot. To chat about, um, but we'll just start, raise your hand, and we'll go and laugh and style. And I apologize about machine gunning some of that information. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's start with you. Yeah. What was your biggest pivot in your company or your uh, business? In your for, business? For, for Art Lab or just yeah, for Art Lab. For Art Lab. <laughs> Um, the biggest pivot was building 3D printers. I originally started, at least when I was at the makerspace, I was going to build your kit printer for you. That's basically what it was, because there wasn't there wasn't pre-assembled 3D printers that were for sale at the time. So I would build your kit printer, I would teach you how to use it, and it would be like this like $500 experience. You know what I mean? Everything is slap done. Even if it was like your kid, you bought it for Christmas, that kind of thing. Turns out, the reason why that's very problematic and, and, and is liability, at the end of the day, if I made one mistake and accidentally caused the fire, that would be my fault. That would, be, and that's the thing. At the time, three D printers were relatively, relatively dangerous. Like they're experimental. They're meant. They're, they weren't exactly meant to uh, be left on for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, idle without anyone paying attention to them. Uh, they they would they would cause a short in the cabling and cause a fire. And there was a there, there wasn't any like thing that happened to me with that, but I the last 3D printer I built for a client was a company called Denmo, and Denmo in Kentucky was actually a Japanese company that had a manufacturing wing, and that manufacturing wing asked me to make a 3D printer that had a two foot build volume, like being able to print two feet this way, two feet this way. Um, that thing barely worked, and I felt rather ashamed of making it, honestly, even though that that's exactly what they ordered, exactly what it was. If I was more experienced and more knowledgeable about how about the actual intricacies of like programming behind it, I probably wouldn't. I probably would still be pursuing that. But the reality is, is that there was a lot more money to be made in people ordering prints than ever building a three D printer for sure. Uh, next question, Eric. Uh, you mentioned resin printing and SLA. What kind of materials can you can print with that? Sure, sure. Uh, resins tend to be um, very 
like when you talk about the resin uh, process, it tends to be more focused on trying to get quality or, or details to come out. So if you do like small models and figures and things like that, the resins tend to be the, uh, the highest quality that you can get out of the 3D printer today. But the resins themselves are limited to essentially composites of the resin. So sometimes they have stronger versions of the resin where it's just filled with a little bit of like glass or some other particulate to make it stronger. There's different colors, there's different, there's different uh, transparencies and, and some of them are flexible. And so it's very similar to plastic, but the difference is, is that they range much less. So the uh, resins essentially create a, um, uh, a, it's the perfect product for making small, high detail things. But then if you try to really push the boundaries and the material limitations, you'll, you'll find them real quick, just because resin tends to crack, tends to fall apart. So, uh -huh. next. Uh, so I recently just got a resin printer and uh, it's got ventilation and everything like that, but how careful do people need to be with, you know, keeping one in a bedroom or a house in uh -huh. terms of ventilation and stuff like that? Yeah, don't keep it in your bedroom. And I'll tell you that it's because it's going to cause headaches. Sure. So the thing is, is that um, a lot of materials off gas and off gassing can sometimes not be dangerous at all. It just can be kind of nauseating or not do anything, right? And the thing is about that is that you really don't know what you're putting in your printer. You just don't. Uh, if you buy, especially if you buy stuff on Amazon, you have no idea what's in there. I recommend putting it into like a, 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 a garage or some other ventilated space that is dedicated for, uh, that's just not in your living space, especially around like kids and all that kind of stuff. They'll be more sensitive to it. Your pets will be more sensitive to it as well. Uh, and resin is also toxic to pets. So just be careful with that. Um, but overall, I, I, I would recommend that when you're working with resins in particular, that you wear gloves. You need to be very careful with skin contact with resins. They, a lot of people are allergic to resins, and they don't know it. So you will know it because everything starts itching and you go red. So, uh, but yes, some, 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 some resins have off-gassing, but most don't. I just think it might, I would avoid that for sure. Yeah. Next question? If I had an idea for something like a mask, but I didn't have the design, the modeling skills, but I knew I wanted it to be 3D printed, mm -hmm. would you be able to help me with the designing or would I need to find that service someplace else? Oh no, I'll definitely be able to help you with that. Not only that, I could scan your face and then we can make it fit you perfectly. Um, <laughs> we probably want to bump it up an extra percent or so to give you enough room for like your cheeks and stuff like that. Like <laughs> that's the thing, people don't realize how much your face distorts when you smile and you get angry and all that stuff. And your mask, and when you print and you scan that stuff, if you make it one to one, it's gonna feel like you're being suffocated because it's you know like completely like vacuum form to your face. Um, and uh, and for some people, I mean, I've printed like masks before that have spooked people when they put it on because it's just it presses every part of your face. It's not just sitting on your cheekbones, you know. So yeah, definitely, definitely, we can do that. Especially when we start to talk about trying to like take popular things and make them into masks, we can do that too. So yeah. And uh, any other questions? Uh, you'd said when ordering on like Amazon materials that you really don't know what's in there. Is there not a lot of like regulation around? Right. Uh, is there a push for that? Hmm? Um, so it, you really need the public to want it yeah. for there to be a push. And right now this technology is so new that you really don't know what really what is uh, like what, what the end result is. Like we, we, when we started the 3D printing back in the, or like around 2010 or so, um, I was printing ABS in my house. And ABS causes nausea when it's off gassing. And I didn't know that for about three weeks why I was getting sick, like why I was getting busy. And it, it was simply because I was running a 3D printer next to my desk, like, like on my desk right there. I was you know, fiddling away with some visual effects stuff and that little printer was going. Turns out I was, I was, uh, uh, it was toxic. It was toxic to me. So I stopped printing with ABS after that and moved over to PLA. PLA is all corn. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, so PLA is safe to print, safe to have in your room, that kind of thing. But here's the other element to that. The printers themselves can off gas too. Sometimes they have lubricants and things in there that when they get heated up, they off gas, they start to create an odor. And so if you smell anything, do anything like that, you probably want to move your printer. Okay. I want to put it somewhere safe. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so I've been printing with the TPU on my printer. And awesome. Yeah, it's been having a lot of stringing issues. Yeah. Uh, is there like what what that? kind of printer do you got? Uh, an Ender Three V Two Neo. Okay, so it's got a it's got a Bowden tube though. Yes. Yes. So that's why that's okay. why you're getting all the hair. What you need to do is call a direct drive upgrade because FTPUs flexible materials they don't like to be strung along a big tube. They just get all wobbly. You know, it, it, what he's talking about is TPUs. It's almost like a noodle. It is so soft. It, it, like it, it's like it's like a cooked spaghetti. So because of that, you, the longer that tube, the longer that plastic has to travel through the tube, the more unreliable it is by the time it gets to the extruder. So if you do a direct drive with the motor where the extruder sits right on top of the hot end, you won't have that head swinging issue anymore because okay. it, it's much more reliable on, on your retraction and the extruder. Okay. Yeah. I, I, if, if there's anything else, just ask me. I'm happy to help you with that. Great. Uh, any? Yeah. Yep. Do you have any opinions on how 3D printing will like, continue to affect like healthcare, oh, and yeah. accessibility. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and I didn't get into the speculative stuff. I tend, I'm a, I do tend to consider myself a futurist, but I try not to spend, like predict too much because it can kind of go all over the place. But medical, I think biomed is the most exciting field, period, when it comes to 3D printing and everything related to that. Because you can print the scaffold for like a heart and then regrow the cells for your heart around that scaffold because you 3D printed the scaffold out of a bio. A, a version of your own cells. And that is something that's being done, you know, in, in a couple different um, universities around the country. But you're talking about right now, like heart, like like rat hearts and livers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's not ready for human application necessarily, but we're much closer than people think when it comes to that. Uh, otherwise, ferrofood, being able to print with magnetic materials right off the, right off the bat. So the idea with it, is that you would have a vat of me metallic or just metal composite material, and then imagine a bunch of cylinders of magnets that when you hit a button, it instantly forms that ferrofluid to that shape. Like instantly. We're talking about instant 3D printing with that. And that is something that's actually probably gonna start making use here soon. That's what that would be my prediction. Is a 3D printer that can make things in about something about two seconds. So night and day difference compared to today. Uh, any other questions? Um, did you mention PLA is not really biodegradable? Can you recycle it in any way possible? You cannot! That's the fun part about PLAs is that your the recycling companies, even though they could biocompose it and all that stuff, there's just not a method for it. You don't have a label on the bottom of your 3D prints that tells it what kind of recycle it is. You, you notice on the bottom of like a, a, a soda bottle or anything like that, they'll always have the recycling symbol with like a circle around it and a shape usually. I think it's actually a triangle. You need that symbol for it to be recycled. It will, they will not accept anything that doesn't have that symbol. And guess what? Everything you 3D print doesn't have that symbol. Uh, unless you've got it in your way, you put it on there, which is kind of silly when you think about it. But yeah, it's, it's, recycling is, is a kind of a flawed concept in some ways as well. And I don't want to get into that too much because a lot of people get upset by hearing that. But uh, the reality is, is that recycling just, it's really hard to recycle materials where anyone can do anything with it and then randomly change what's inside of it too. So like if I'm printing something out of a plastic I know can be biodegraded, I could also just shove a bunch of non-biodegradable plastic inside that same design by either doing like multi-parts or compartmentalized or whatever. And then suddenly it's a multi-material thing and it no longer can be recycled at all. Um, <clears throat> great talk by the way. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, I see a group of people here. Some have the three D printer at home. It's awesome. You have a whole lab of them. Could you talk a little bit about the emphasis on as VFX in film and all the stuff has been? It's it's increasingly going more digital. Mm -hmm. um, AR is a big part of where. I, what I'm trying to get at is the. Future is, in a lot of ways, should be more in teaching about modeling. Mm -hmm. And is there, have you seen an emphasis on the idea that, you know, we think of, you get a 3D printer, you buy something, you're like, oh, cool, I can sell these things. Mm -hmm. But the amount of people who are modeling things, not even printing a single thing, but they're putting files available for people to download or purchase which those skills can also be used in a variety of applications too. Can you speak a little bit to the emphasis on, we think about 
the printers because they're cool and they give you something physical, but at the same time, the models, which is an incredibly profitable uh, skill set to have, um, you know, how do we, what, what where, where do you see the importance of that playing sure. into all of this? Well, I mean, the, the, the important thing about design and CAD is just that you're able to really control every aspect of something. A lot of people that get into this stuff, they maybe try out a couple programs, but they don't really master it. They don't really become familiar with all the ins and outs and how to really make, because uh, it's one thing to make something for yourself and make a bunch of mistakes and try it. It's a whole other beast to make it for professional, or for, for a company or whatever. you got to deliver on a deadline kind of situation. And at least when it comes to the amount of people who suddenly had a skill that was very applicable to a lot of people, that was jarring for most of the designers that I knew because they suddenly went from, I have this obscure job that you just don't understand to everyone wants to money to do something for them. It's like owning a pickup truck. Suddenly everyone wants you to help ship their thing for them, move their house or their, you know, whatever. And that can be very overwhelming for, uh, for a designer to the point where so I've, I've, I've had a couple of designers that worked like mostly in firearms that were then brought into the 3D printing world and then realized just how bad of a mistake that was. Because firearms and 3D printers do not mix. Right? They don't. They're basically, they're, anyone that 3D prints a gun is more likely going to kill themselves than anyone they pointed at. And it's simply because it's gonna explode in their hand. But the and process so, of learning that model and then figuring out how to bring it into like a five axis machine or something like that, mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, that core of understanding modeling should be, do you think it's just as important as being able to understand like how to, like you said, manufacture something? I, I personally think that it's actually less important to necessarily know how to do the design than it is to know how to do it. Like what's the workflow yeah. for making it? Most of the people I know that do design work, um, they tend to work best and work well with people who do their own research, that figure stuff out for themselves, at least in some way. And then when they have a problem, they run into a roadblock, that's where they reach out to them and they tend to make things more efficiently that way. When, when people are just kind of expecting designers to go to hop massive industries in order just to make that thing for them, it, it's, it can be just too jarring to, to approach. So I don't know if that's exactly the answer uh, to give your, to your question, but I do think that when it comes to CAD, it's gonna be less and less important to know those technical skills. And that's simply because of everything from like artificial intelligence all the way to what you can do now with uh, community projects. Yeah. There's, it's, there, there's a lot of stuff you can just print right now. I, I honestly do not know why companies like Ikea and stuff don't provide 3D files for all the little missing parts for your stuff, you know, all the little things, because it would be a, a social good for, the, for your customers to be able to do that. Uh, and, and that doesn't require a CAD designer anymore. It just requires the company to release those. So I hope that answers it, at least, at least in some direction. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. I'm loving all the questions. We are a few minutes over. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so maybe we'll reserve it for final two questions. So raise your hands high for them. Yep, anyone else? Yeah, there you go. Um, do you have any tips on leveling your bed? Like, yeah. On a PLA printer? For, for a what printer? Like on PLA. Okay, okay. So um, there is a, uh, the first thing you want to do is actually not level the bed. The first thing you want to do is put a can of soup on. And the reason why you do that is because soup cans are manufactured to a very specific form and you can level your x-axis. You know, the, the, the what kind of printer do you have? Um, mm -hmm. It's similar to reality. Okay, like yeah. So then you can take the arms and put it on top of the soup can. What that's going to do is it's going to level the arms, the x-axis, and after you know that that's level, both sides are, are balanced, then tram, what is called tramming the bed, leveling the bed. And the best way to do that is just to bring the nozzle all the way to the bed and then put it all four corners. So you, have, you move the extruder to the corner, adjust the knob, move it to the other corner, adjust the knob, so on and so forth, and then do it again to make sure that it's right. Yeah. That's the best way. But there's other tips on YouTube you can find as well. Um, if, if, uh, it's, if I would recommend, there's a guy uh, named Maker's Muse. Yeah. Maker's Muse. Watch his stuff if you haven't already. Okay. Yeah, is, is that paper trick? Is that like actually like a thing or is that just a myth? 
<laughs> no, no, you can definitely use the paper trick. <laughs> the problem is, is that uh, the, the paper trick means it's a, it, it's too easy to tell. It's, I mean, it's too hard to tell exactly when you write on it. Yeah. It's actually better to use your eyes, just oh, to put right. your eyes at the bed level and then see where the nozzle's almost touching. It can't touch, but almost touching, and then move on. And then, then move to the next corner. Or, or. Does, that, does that help? Yeah. Awesome. Good. Awesome. All right, one more question. Whew. Any recommendation on the slicers? Yeah. Okay. We got we got we got we got a user here too. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, I would recommend Idea Maker. I love Idea Maker, uh, but I also sell raised three D printers, so there's a reason for that. But Idea Maker lets you do some really dynamic stuff. Uh, otherwise, Prusa. Anything from Prusa is good. Um, but the, the reason why I recommend Idea Maker is that it has this really cool dynamic texture bump map feature, which essentially lets you make things look like wood with just a button. Super super cool. Um, and I think that's exclusive to Idea Maker. So, and it's free and it works with every printer, you just have to set it up. So, all right. Thanks, it. everyone. Thank you, Ben. Um, I promise I will make this quick. Thank you all for attending. A reminder our next tech talk is on February 9th. We're going to be at the ORDOC this time, so just down the road. Um, we do have staff on hand, so like I said, we're a resource for you. We partner with great um, people like Ben um, for prototyping services, patent advice, you name it. We are here to help entrepreneurs, specifically within um, the tech industry. We're here to help tech startups and tech innovators. So if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them and see how we can help you. Um, come over to the checking table. We can literally get you started with the process of submitting your idea right here before you leave the library. Um, but hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Take that survey, it'll be really quick, I promise. There's still food over there, I see, so load up before you hit the road and drive safely, everyone. All right, good. <laughs>